Good morning, Gateway Bible Church. Please turn in your scriptures to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. As we begin our new sermon series on the move, we are through with Samaria. Before we go any further, I would just ask that with me you would join me and uh, consult the Holy Spirit so that we can know exactly what it is that we are to take away from the scriptures that we interact with today. Would you do that? Would you bow your heads and your hearts? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that we have this antidote for the world. We have an antidote for those hardships, those difficulties that all of us will encounter. Lord, as it gets progressively weirder out there, we know that we have sanctuary in here because precisely you are here. And you are here, you've called us all here for a purpose today. Lord, help us to understand what that purpose is and seal these scriptures in our hearts as we continue in Jesus' name, amen. Let's back up just a little bit, shall we? Uh, if you remember, the very last verse of chapter 12 is this. It says, Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. And they also took with them uh, John, whose surname is Mark. What's going on? Barnabas and Saul, we see them yet uh, again. What's happened? They have delivered the offering to the church, to the forlorn, to the beaten down, to the persecuted church in Jerusalem. Where'd they get it? They got it from all of the, the believers, the disciples in Antioch, because there's this great famine. There's this massive famine, and they know that Jerusalem is suffering. They know that Jerusalem has been persecuted. John's been killed. Peter's been put in prison. So the, the church in Antioch sends this funds, this money, to Jerusalem via Paul and, um, uh, I'm sorry, Saul. He's not Paul just yet. Saul and Barnabas. No doubt when that pair was in uh, Jerusalem, they heard that amazing story of what happened to Peter, his miraculous release from prison by the angel. And then they return to Antioch in the north and they take with them John Mark. This threesome does not know what is about to hit them. They are about to receive their marching orders. They are about to go on the move. They are about to get intimately equated with the hardships of army life. That is what we see here this morning. By a show of hands. By the way, can you tell I'm a little animated today? <laughs> By a show of hands. How many of you are familiar with Murphy's Law? Show of hands. Don't be embarrassed if, you're, if you don't know what that is. Uh, Murphy's Law states that nothing is simple as it seems. Murphy's Law states that everything takes longer than you think it will. Murphy's Law dictates that if anything can go wrong, it will go wrong. My friends, whoever you are, here this morning, rich, poor, white, black, young, old, sinner, saint, I have news for you. You're going to encounter hardships. Amen? The only time when your troubles are ceasing, the only time when your troubles are going to cease is when you leave this world and go to the next. Oh, and by the way, if you're not a believer, your troubles are just beginning. Let me be clearer. Life is continually difficult, even for Christians. Receive Christ. And everything will be fine and wonderful. 
Hogwash. Silly. It's just not true. I wish that it was because I could make big bucks. I could write a book right now in the midst of all of the unrest that's going on right now. I could, I could write a book in the midst of the pandemic that said all you need to do is receive Christ and your worries magically fade away. Your difficulties magically disappear. We know that's not true. We have all met fine, robust, faithful believers, amen, that have had difficulties, that have had uh, very uh, painful things happen to them. Some are battling disease. Some uh, have agonizing family relationships. Some have experienced financial quagmires. Things happen. Employers, they'll mess with you. Family members will forsake you. Friends will forsake you. They are human. This is a part of the human condition. In fact, uh, dedication to Christ often brings us face to face with greater difficulties than if we were just simply living for ourselves. Amen? There's a war on. And how we view that war makes a, a, a vast difference in our ability to fight that war. Just as it did with Paul, the great uh, missionary general. And just as it did with John Mark, interestingly, who we will discover this morning is the first missionary casualty. It begins uh, in verse 1 of chapter 13, where we discover this incredible church faculty, this staff, this, this wonderful church staff that is heading the church in Antioch. It says there, now... In the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius the Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Wow, this staff is amazingly diverse. And Luke sees fit as he writes the uh, book of Acts to give us a little picture of that diversity. You've got the Hellenist Bar Barnabas, remember? He's a Jew, but he's raised in foreign lands. On the island of Cyprus, interestingly enough, you have the Africans. You have uh, Simeon, who's also called Niger. You have Lucius of Cyrene. This is all Africa. You have Menean, who is reared as a part of Herod's household, of all things, and you've got Rabbi Saul. Antioch is where the action is. Teachers are teaching. Prophets are prophesying. This church becomes a microcosm of the church that's going to spread across the known world. And these people are going to receive a commission. They're marching orders from the Holy Spirit. Look what it says in verse 2. It says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now... The work to which I have called them, uh, separate to me Barnabas and Saul. Separate Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then, having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. Wow. Let's just break that down a little tiny bit. Where did those marching orders come from? It comes, they come from God himself. While this group is doing what? Worshiping and ministering. They're fasting. They're praying. They're singing. They're rejoicing. Sound familiar? 
It appears that the entire church in Antioch is involved. And as we said earlier when we were praying this morning, notice that they are worshiping and ministering. Those two things, my friends, should never be separated. For uh, if you are working, servicing, doing your ministry for the Lord and you're not worshiping him, you're going to end up with this very legalistic uh, 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 worship, uh, a service. Very self-serving. If you're worshiping and you're never working, you're going to end up with what Paul calls godliness uh, with no power. Who does the commissioning? It's God. It is the Holy Spirit. How does he do the commissioning? Through the church. What does he do? It's through the laying on of hands. You see that? It's not mysterious. They are simply identifying with the, uh, these apostles. They are showing an expression of, of unity as they begin this work of moving out and evangelizing the world. They are going on the move. That's what this is all about. The church, by laying on of hands, is simply, in effect, saying, brothers, we are with you. Where you go, we go. We're part of you. And this is a great example, a great missionary example for all of us today. Now, as we proceed, where do they go? Well, verse 4. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. And from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived in Salami, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they also had John as their assistant. Where do they go? The island of Cyprus. There is no doubt that they are commissioned by the Holy Spirit. They are commissioned. And they have this willingness to follow wherever the Holy Spirit says. And I... I couldn't help but reflecting uh, this week on that poem that I've read so often and often gets used in sports films and even there was an even a movie about it. The poem was called Invictus. I'm not going to read the entire poem. It's by William uh, Ernest Henley. But the last stanza always grabs me. It says this. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll, and you know these two lines. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. My friends, that grabs me because that stands in stark contrast to what you are reading here this morning. Paul and Barnabas are not the master of their souls. Amen. Jesus Christ is the master of their souls. And because Jesus is the master of their souls, he instills in them this bravery. And this bravery, as it turns out, is going to be extremely necessary. Saul and Barnabas, these two, it's Saul and Barnabas against the world. Literally, they are God's ambassadors. And they are modeling for us today something very powerful, something very important. It is the willingness to follow the Spirit's leading. And I know many of you throughout the years have had that experience of the uh, Spirit leading you in a particular direction. If God is speaking to us, we must go. We must follow. When the Spirit grabs a hold of you, my friends, when the Spirit grabs a hold of you, you will do things that you said that you will never do. Have you ever had that experience? It certainly happened to me. I see a lot of hands raised. When the Spirit grabs hold of you, that transcendent power grabs hold of you, you will do things that you said you would never do. Let me give you my personal example. I said, interestingly enough, 
in my younger days that I would never start a church. I said in my younger days that I would never pastor a church. And apparently God thought that was humorous. <laughs> never say never to God. Amen? Amen? Now, what's the trajectory of this first mission trip? It's quite simple. They're going to sail from Seleucia. And you can see that on your screen. Not too far north from Jerusalem itself. In the area of Samaria, particularly in this time in Syria, they're, they're, remember they're in the, town, the city of Antioch, they go immediately to Seleucia, the port city, and they get on the boat and they sail to the island of Cyprus and arrive in Salamis. If you want to say Salamis, that's fine. Now let's talk about Cyprus, just a little bit, because it's important. Cyprus, as you can tell, there in the Mediterranean, is right off the coast. They thought about it in the ancient world, much like we think about Hawaii today. For many of those people, it was this beautiful, and it still is. If you, I've never been there, but if you, anybody ever been to Cyprus? Jan, thank you. It's nice not to. It's nice to get some uh, feedback. Um, it's beautiful. I look through the, I look at the, the, the pictures. It has the perfect climate. It's hard to avoid. It's hard not to get to. It's the crossroads of the Mediterranean. So if you're navigating those waters in the Mediterranean, most people stop at Cyprus. It's a natural place for Barnabas to go. Why? Because he is a Cyprin? A Cyprinian? A Cypriot. Once they get there, their method is simple. Travel the island from east to west, from Salami to uh, Paphos. It's about 90 miles. Preach the gospel. First to the Jewish synagogues. Remember what Paul said, always to the Jews first, but then he goes to the Gentiles. And who do they have with them? They have John Mark. And just like the island of Cyprus, we need a little bit of background and details on this young man who we're going to see a lot of in the next coming chapters. Uh, Mark, as it turns out, is the first ministerial intern. Mark, as it turns out, is Barnabas's cousin. He's from this wealthy family in Jerusalem. He would have been privy, privy to all of those goings on in the holy city. He would have been there. Well, he definitely was there when Peter came knocking at his house after just being released from prison at midnight and wrote, you know the story, Rhoda comes to him and leaves him outside. This is the same man who will write the Gospel of Mark. He's probably enticed by the romance of this quest. After all, he's accompanying the great Barnabas and the great uh, Saul. He's probably thinking that that miracle that happened in Antioch of this explosive expansion of the, of the gospel, of the taking over of the town, that's going to be duplicated on the island of uh, Cyprus. And after all, he says, I'm going on a cruise. I get to go on a cruise with Barnabas and Saul. But soon the realities of the spiritual war now begin to show. At first, nothing happens on the island, not even in Salami, the largest city on the island. But the romance that John Mark is carrying around with him soon begins to fade. And, and John Mark starts to uh, wonder why it is that he went on this trip in the first place. We'll see that. But look what happens in verse 6. Now, when they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man, Sergius Paulus, called for Barnabas and Saul 
and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So here it begins. The first bit of resistance on this exciting, powerful, romantic missionary trip. They meet this very powerful sorcerer. Now, um, when they get to the island, when they get to Paphos in particular, they encounter two men. One is the proconsul. That's a, a fancy Latin term for governor. This guy's the big cheese. His name is Sergius Paulus, and he is in control of the whole island. Or is he? Because they meet two people there. They meet Elia, uh, 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 Elimas the sorcerer. Now, just note that uh, Luke uses the Greek adjective sunetos to describe uh, the, the proconsul, the governor. Intelligent. He's very intelligent. This man, Sergius Paulus, was a man of great understanding, but he's got somebody that is around him all the time with a very dark side. Evidently, Sergius Paulus is looking, he's searching, he wants something more. So he's the one who calls for uh, Barnabas and Paul. But this is why Elymas shows up. Paul and, uh, I mean, sorry, Saul, he's not Paul, Paul yet, Saul and Barnabas show up, so does this sorcerer, because the proconsul has been uh, 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 soliciting his help. He is under this sway, this power of Elymas the sorcerer. And as it says in verse 8, he attempts to turn him away from the faith. This guy, Elymas, is also known as Bar. Jesus, Bar Jesus, sort of a nickname. Bar in Hebrew means son of Jesus. Is this guy masquerading as a descendant of Jesus Christ himself? As a spiritual descendant? He is probably at least saying, I have his magical powers. That's what's going on with Elymas. Uh, Elymas, by the way, is an Arabic word that means skillful one, and you will see that he is very skillful indeed. This guy has immense power. He is controlling the ruler of Cyprus itself, and you just know, my friends, you just know that a major battle is inevitable. Amen? Spiritual Warfare. Spiritual warfare is not a fantasy. It's real. These guys understood it. It was real for Barnabas, Saul, and John Mark, and it is just as real for us today. The truth is, life is difficult, and it's sometimes even more difficult for those who choose to follow Christ. Again, I'm in my study this week, and I am reflecting on so many people that have faced those difficulties simply because they chose to be in Christ's army. The namesake of Mary, William Tyndale, the early 16th century, who dared dared to do one thing, got him strangled on the stake and then burnt. He dared to do one thing. You know what William Tyndale was famous for? He dared to translate the scriptures into English. This is what he says in his very... Last day, he says, all that I do and suffer is but the way to the reward and not the deserving thereof. I don't deserve it. That's William Tyndale. The point is, my friends, that service to the Lord, being in God's army, comes at a cost. Never want to look like a fool? Then never share your faith. 
Never want to be a social pariah? Then never stand firm on any social issue that you know that God wants you to stand firm on. Never want to uh, lose any business? For those of you business owners, then don't practice consistent honesty. Never want to get taken advantage of? Then never reach out to the needy. Amen. Never want to have your heart broken? Then never give your heart. Never want a confrontation with Satan? Then don't sail to the island of Cyprus. Never want to experience the abundance of hardships that are unknown to the outside world, to the unbelievers, then don't seriously follow Christ. That is the lesson that Saul and Barnabas provide for us. But if you do that, if you don't, you will never know the amazing joy in Jesus Christ. Amen? You will never know the amazing power. You will never know the adventure in Jesus Christ. For Saul and Barnabas, the battle is on. And in verse 9, we finally get to meet this new Saul. Look what it says in verse 9. It says, Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. At whom? At the sorcerer, Elements. And said, O fool of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? That's the new Saul. This is the first time in Scripture that Saul's name is changed to Paul, never to be Saul again. Jews uh, often had Jewish and Romans named just like Paul does. He steps into the forefront. He assumes leadership. From now on, it's Paul and Barnabas. From this point on, his name comes first. God is now commissioning his great general. And so verse 9 tells us what? Paul stares intently at the wizard. I can just imagine what that stare was. It was a glare. It was powerful. Before he even opened up his mouth, he, he's staring at him. And then Paul excoriates Elymas. Son of the devil! There are people today, even good people in the church, that think that there's no way that Paul should be talking like this. How can Paul talk like this to anyone, they would say? You know what the answer is? Verse 9. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. It was through the discernment of the Holy Spirit provided to him by God that he could look straight into Elymas' heart. And the truth needed to be spoken. The light needed to be shined as a disinfectant on what is going on here. Paul loves Jesus, my friends, and he's filled with the spirit of God's love. But sometimes, sometimes that spirit of love is a spirit of fire. And this is exactly what Paul provides. And much more than that. Look what happens in verse 11. The sorcerer is struck Blind. And now, Paul says, indeed, the hand of the Lord is upon you. You shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. And then the proconsul believed. That's amazing. Then the Roman governor of the island believed. When he saw what had been done, being astonished 
at the teaching of the Lord. Wow. Sorcerer's struck mine. Sergius Paulus, the proconsul, is converted. Is he converted because of the miracle that happened in blinding the wizard Elymas? No. Very clearly. Why is he converted? He's converted by the teaching of the Lord in verse 12. My friends, that is exactly what we do here today. Someone has to speak God's truth. It's the antidote to what exists out there in the world. And I also find this interesting, by the way. As I was studying this week, there is archaeological evidence on the island of Cyprus itself that Sergius Paulus did become a believer, did get converted. There are inscriptions there on the island, and it wasn't only Sergius Paulus, but his whole family became believers, became Christians. That is amazing because of the teaching of the word. Now, the question becomes, how did all of this affect John Mark? Let's finish with verse 13. Now, when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, return to Jerusalem. That is a very familiar passage to so many of us here this morning. That is the famous split, the famous departure. It will get speaking, speaking of, spoken of much in the coming chapters. Because what you are witnessing here is that the realities of missionary life are too much for John Mark. He romanticized this whole thing. He fantasized. He prejudged the whole experience. But reality is different because when you set out to serve the Lord, you will always experience those disappointments. He gets to the island. Things seem to be going smoothly at first, but soon here come the disappointments. He starts to feel ineffective in his ministry. No one's getting saved. Finally, they get to Paphos. And yes, there is one convert, but look at the expense for one convert. Look at the fight for just one soul. And now they're leaving the happy isle. They're leaving the, the, the wonderful, beautiful climate and the, and the great party island, and now they're going for some place that's much darker. They're going to Pamphylia, Perga, 175 miles away. And you know what that place is known for, interestingly enough? Malaria. Maybe John Mark even encounters pestilence while he's there in the area. It is probably, most scholars believe, that is what Paul contracted. When he gets to Perga, he doesn't preach there. He goes, he, he's there for a while, no preaching, no record. He goes straight to Galatia. In fact, in Galatians 4.13, this is what Paul says. He says, you know, talking to the Galatians, that because of my physical infirmity, I preach the gospel to you at the first. So, all of this, along with John Mark's privileged upbringing, was simply too much for the young man. He goes home. He does not understand the realities of war, spiritual warfare. And Paul is not happy. Paul thinks that he is a deserter. He calls him as much. When they finally get home, Paul and Barnabas, from the end of this first missionary journey, Paul has a great idea. He wants to go back and visit all the cities that they visited. And Barnabas has another idea as well. This is what happens in Acts chapter 15, verse 37. It says, now Barnabas was de determined to take with them John Mark. They're back in Antioch. 
But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And then the contention became so sharp that Paul and Barnabas split and departed from one another. Let's be real. Life is difficult. Life is difficult even for Christians. And if you decide to truly and fully give yourself to Jesus Christ, you are going to experience those fiery darts from the enemy. Amen? It's just the way it is. And interestingly enough, one of the reasons the Holy Spirit sees fit to write it down so that you and I are studying it this morning is because the same thing happens to us. We, like John Mark, can fall away from our commitments. Amen? Don't raise your hand. Who's done it before? Be honest. I have done it in the past. Because the sad reality is, my friends, the sad reality is, and I'm going to be very politic here, I'm going to be very careful, but notice the pronouns that I am employing. Notice the, the, notice the uh, pronoun that I am deploying right now. We can be wimps. Please, Look at the pronoun. We, I am included. Many times we can be soft. We can be wimps. We say to ourselves when we get that calling from God to go somewhere to do something, this cannot be God's will. Why? It's too difficult. It's too painful. Therefore, ding, 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 must not have been God's will in the first place. It hurts. But there is good news. There is hope. God loves to give us another chance. John Mark gets another chance. John Mark grows up, matures, gets back out there into the service of God goes on those missionary trips, writes the Gospel of Mark, so much so that he rejoins the Apostle Paul. Look what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. He says, Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me in the ministry. Isn't that beautiful? Yes, there's separation, but there is also reconciliation. Now, Paul being full of the Holy Spirit. He understand that bright reality. He understand that it is difficult in service to Christ, but there is no difficulty that Christ cannot see us through. Amen? That's why you're here this morning. That's why you need to hear those words. There is no difficulty that Christ cannot see you through. Later, the apostle will go on to write these victorious words. He says in Romans chapter 8, like Bruce read for us this morning, he says, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Wow. With Christ, there is incredible optimism and power and joy and hope. Yes, we are called to war. Spirit, and, and my friends, if you're not hip to that fact, get hip to it now. Spiritual warfare is a reality, but there is tremendous optimism. There's tremendous motivation. Onward, Christian soldiers. But we can't go into that war with these romantic, glorified expectations. It's difficult, but through Christ, we are more than conquerors. Amen? He will see us through. Close your scriptures for me.